So today I want to talk about windows and the thermal performance associated with windows. So uh, this is copied out of um, the Energy Star government website. There's a number of good websites that have a lot of information. So I'll refer to a few of them today in the discussion. So the NFRC, the National Fenestration Rating Council, I understand council, rating, and national, but this word is kind of new. Architectural term for windows and openings of buildings, fenestration. So anyway, that council has uh, worked with the government, the, the Energy Star, which I think is a DOE, EPA joint effort to certify windows, doors, skylights, etc. And they talk about performance and they talk about the U factor and the solar heat gain coefficient, air leakage, we just won't have time to talk about. The visible transmission, that's very, very important for windows. I mean, what's the purpose of a window? Is you want to be able to look outside and you want a little daylight to come inside. That's the purpose of a window. Otherwise, just board it all up and have walls, right? And then uh, condensation resistance, we're not really going to talk about that either. But uh, just focus on windows, not focus on skylights, and uh, not focus on doors, just windows. Okay, so kind of first of all, what's a U-factor? So the U-factor is a measure of the rate of heat transfer and tells you how well the windows provide insulation. <clears throat> and uh, they range from about 0.25 to 1.25, depending on the quality of the window. And they have funny units. Look at the units here. So I'm going to talk about the U-factor in United States uh, customary system of units, which has this BTU per hour. And often they don't put an HR. They just H for hour. Foot squared degree F. All right. And the lower that value is, the better the window is at insulating the house not allowing heat in or out, depending if it's uh, summer or winter. Okay, they also have, if you want an energy start, they have a certain rating for it. And then we'll talk about the solar heat gain coefficient and then the visible light transmission. Here's a label. Maybe you've seen a label like this. You can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, go to the window selection area and look at the labels, usually right in the middle of the glass. Um, how many people have seen a label like this on a window? Yeah. And so let's just jump into it. First of all, they make low E windows, double pane low E windows, starting in the late 70s. This is kind of new. Before that, there was single pane windows in homes all over. And then they moved to double pane, and then they went to low E uh, double pane windows in the late 70s. Okay, 1970s. They introduced the low E technology and the double E pane windows. They introduced it all for northern cold climates. So it was all these double pane windows were for cold climate. All right, do we live in a cold climate? No, but a lot of the United States, here's one of my favorite states, Minnesota, right? Uh, that's cold in the winter up there. So often that sets sort of the lower 48, lowest temperature on record for that day is set somewhere in Minnesota, right on the Canadian border. Uh, I forget the name of the city. Uh, International Falls, is that it? Minnesota, somebody familiar with that? But anyway, in the winter you see that they report low temperatures and often, or in North Dakota or Montana. Okay, so uh, this window would not be good for Texas. So, but that's traditional. Now they have developed windows. We'll talk about the difference in the windows. Low E windows for a hot climate for the southern part of the world or the United States. Okay, so they typically have a um, company name and manufacturer. And what do they talk about here? It's a vinyl clad wood frame. They're going to talk about what happens in the center of the window as if you're moving heat through the center of the window. But you know, the frame and that material to hold it in place is very, very important. And uh, they found that you know, even though it's a small percentage of the overall area, 
there could be a lot of heat transmission through the frame. So the engineers pay a lot of attention to that, designers. Um, and when you come up with the average coefficient for the window, it counts for some weighted average of what's going on in the frame. Okay, and then it's a double glazing. What does that mean? Double pane. Two window panes separated by a distance. Okay, it also has uh, argon. I don't know if you can read that. Argon gas backfill between the two panes. That's very common. Um, and then it's low emissivity. And the low emissivity um, is a, a treatment to a surface of the glass. And if you look at it, if you have two panes, you have a surface one here. Maybe this is the outside of the house. This is the inside of the house. And you could put it also treat surface number two or surface number three, or surface number four. So think about this. This is the first clicker question. Is you are not going to treat all four surfaces. Let's say you're going to do something. You're going to treat one of those surfaces of the window with a coating to help uh, resist heat transfer in a particular direction. Maybe in the, in the summer, and you live in the uh, hot climate, you want to resist heat transfer that direction because the hot to the inside of the house. But in the winter, if you live in a cold climate, you're going to resist the heat transfer in that direction. You want to keep the house warm. So it's, yeah, it can peel a little bit or you can scratch it or you can tear into it or mess it up. Um, so you might want to think about that practical aspect. Which one do you want to avoid putting any treatment to? Surface 1, A, or surface 2, B, or C, or D? Which one typically gets dirtier, the outside surface of the window or the inside surface? The outside, which one usually they go and spray and then clean it, right? And so they, it's, it's probably not the surface to put a sensitive uh, treatment onto. So I agree, you want to avoid it. So they're going to treat surface two and surface three. And actually, they'll focus on surface two, maybe the preferential surface for the southern climates, and maybe surface three is the preferential surface for the winter climates, you know, the northern climates. Okay, but we're going to ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I wanted to introduce that concept of double pane, and then you have some low E windows, and they'll be treating a certain location. And you want to avoid uh, one and four, just because they could be cleaned and knocked off and damaged. Now, some of the um, uh, treatments are harder uh, to the glass and more resistant to abrasion or, or uh, scratches. Okay, let's continue to look at this. This is a U factor, and that has a numeric value of 0.27. But right here they say US slash IP. What do they mean by US slash IP? In those units, in inch pound. I know we haven't emphasized that. I'm setting you up for failure when you graduate. Because you're going to go out, and the first thing is not like, no, well, we haven't converted in this industry over to watts and meters and degrees C. We're, we're in BTUs and hours and foot and uh, degree F. But anyway, in the United States, we'll get there eventually. Then the solar heat gain coefficient is here. This is the visible transmittance. This is pretty easy to understand. Light, the visible light's about 0.4 to 0.8. 0.7, somewhere in there, micron, and that's why we have a window, is <laughs> because I want to be able to see outside and to let the light through. And you see that's not 100%, so windows do knock it down, and sometimes you can look through a window and it's quite heavily tinted, and some of the E-coatings look like tinting, you know, they're not as clear as other windows, the 51% uh, transmittance. You don't need 100% transmittance. You, but 50%, you probably notice it. And air leakage, we're not going to talk about. Okay. So again, uh, it depends on the climate. Uh, down here, uh, we're really worried about the summer and the cooling bill. And up here, what are they worried about? 
And where were the first double pane windows introduced? And what were the first low E windows were introduced for northern climates? So you'll see, still see that dominating the discussion. All right. So here are some values of this U factor. Notice they put a subscript right here, one. We come down and look here, and it's in these units. Sometimes they don't tell you. They just say, hey, it's uh, the United States inch pound. you got to know what it means. It's just like an um, ear rating. Ear has units to it. Energy efficiency ratio. Um, or SEER, seasonal energy efficiency ratio. That has implied units, but nobody really remembers the units. They just know what the value means. Same here on the U factor. But uh, notice that uh, for the southern climate, um, you know, just needs to, to have a really good window, you just need it below 0.4. And then for a northern, you really should have kind of a smaller, a lower value for the U factor in those units. So here's some questions for you. Um, we'll take it verbally out loud, no clicker question. Let me get this out of the way. So it's uh, what is the lowest temperature that you've lived in as an individual? Um, you know, maybe you've been to Alaska. Maybe you spent the winter in Alaska. I don't know. But some of you haven't been out of Texas, so it's not going to be that cold. You have to almost be out of Texas to answer this question. On a cold winter night, how low has it been? Maybe you were inside the house and you only had to go outside to get to a car back in or you read the thermometer. But who's been in, who's, who's been where it's cold? And I think the lowest it's ever, where I lived, it was like 15 degrees. 15F? Yeah. Okay, so we have a vote for 15F. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, in upstate New York, uh, this might not have been the actual temperature, but this is what it was supposed to feel like, which was minus 19. Minus, uh, let's round that up to 20F. Seven. Seven? Seven degrees F. Where'd you get that one? Love it. Love it. Okay. Yeah, up the panhandle. So, anybody else? Anybody in the vicinity? What'd you get? Minus 15. Minus 15. Minus 15 degrees F. Minus five. Minus five degrees F. All right. Now, the next question. You uh, want to be in a house, you want to sleep that night. Typically winter, the coldest time is like 4 or 5 a.m., right? Middle of the night. Uh, winter, you know, the sun's down. So you're sleeping. What is the temperature <clears throat> on that cold winter night of the house that you're sleeping in, or apartment that you're sleeping in? What do you want it to be? 60. So you're, you're comfortable at 60? 70s, somebody threw out 70. Especially if you have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Right? You don't want it to be. No, no, not 100. Okay, so now let's pick one of these. Let's say, uh, I don't know, let's pick, uh, I don't know, let's pick, uh, you just have to pick one. You can see there's a lot of variability in this, but let's pick um, negative, uh, I don't know, 10 degrees F. And let's pick 70. Okay, what's the delta T? Cross that window. That's an 80 degree F, delta T, isn't it? Okay, let's do the same thing for the summer. There's a point to this. So how hot was it been last summer? San Antonio, Houston? Really? Got the 110 last summer? Air temp at the airport? I, th I didn't think it broke 105. No, no, not surface temperature on a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're talking, we're talking air temp at the airport. Is it really 105? I think you're really at the extreme. Okay, so let's say 105. Now, what is the temperature of the inside of your house on that 105 August day? 72. 72. You're not paying the electric bill, I can tell. Your parents are still paying the electric bill, or the apartment complex picking that up. 75, okay? I mean, come on, the 75, make the math easier. What is the delta T? 30. All right, tough question. Which is a bigger number? Or are they similar in size, the delta T? Winter, up north, 
you can really have it. It's a severe delta T between the inside of your house and the outside of your house versus the summer. But what do they have down here in the summer? They have the S-U-N. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Up there, we're talking the middle of the night. There's no sun. If they, they want their windows to be really well insulating in the middle of the night, but also in the middle of the day, in the, when the sun does come up, it's not that strong, not like in August in San Antonio, but they do want that sunlight inside their house to help warm it. So that's why this doesn't have to be so low for a southern climate. It's like 0.4 is acceptable. Where up north, you really want to push the U factor down. You really want a high efficiency window, you want to U factor down. But then the solar heat gain coefficient. Okay, in the northern climate, when the sun does come out, would you like a lot of heat getting into your house because of the sun's presence? You would like a fairly high solar heat gain coefficient compared to. Do you want a lot of that sun? You just want a little light in. You don't want all the heat from the sunlight into your house, right? So that's why in a southern climate, this can be higher. This needs to be the focus on making it low, the solar heat gain coefficient. And likewise, up here, you're not going to pick up a whole lot more, but you're going to let that be as high as possible. All right. Okay, we're struggling with units you have a cell phone you have your textbook you have your equation sheet you have your friend next to you you have a lot of things and i'm saying that one watt per meter squared degree c is equivalent to so many btus per hour foot squared degree f because the u factor was our in this units isn't it so fill in the blank i'll walk around because we're going to make some calculations okay we're going to jump back and forth between SI and then US customary system of units. So one watt per meter squared degree C is right. Let's do this. It's uh, 5.678 watts per meter squared degree C is equal to one BTU per hour foot squared degree F. See if that's consistent with your answer that go back this way. So what number do you put in here? Okay, we're going to use this uh, conversion. Um, this is the, a good way to do it, or the 0.17612, uh, et cetera. Okay? So this U factor that's reported in the window for the window is not a simple, easy calculation. It's easy enough. You have all the tools to reproduce and make the calculation. We're going to do that. But it accounts for the thermal properties of the window assembly materials, especially around the edges. We're not going to do the edges. We're just going to go in the center of the glass. Sometimes it'll be like COG. What's that acronym? Another one, right? But center of the glass, just straight through the middle of the glass. And uh, it depends on what the outdoor temperature, what's the outdoor wind speed. You got to have to pick it. And the engineers that report these have sort of standardized, so everybody picks the same one, and then they can report different windows to the same conditions, and the same interior temperature. Okay, they typically list uh, the winter U factor. Okay. Uh, and it's determined under fairly harsh winter conditions, not the most severe. It would be like 15 mile per hour wind on the outside, 70 degree F indoor air temp, zero degree F outdoor air temp. And what's happening on the inside? Well, it'd be like inside this room. So what is the convection coefficient? Well, we don't have 15 mile per hour wind in this room, do we? It's pretty much still air. But there is some movement to it. There's some natural convection to it. Okay, now this overall U factor is a film coefficient, uh, includes the convection and the radiation, not just convection only. Um, it, it has an emittance associated with the glass of 0.9, that's kind of a pick, and a surface to air temperature difference of 10 and a surface temperature of about 70. So if I had to draw it like this, let's do this. I have a, a single pane glass window. And I have the outdoor all at zero degrees F. And I have the interior 
at 70 degrees F. You have the wind blowing, so you're going to have convection. And then you have some movement in the room. Not a lot, but it's not still completely still air. And now we're interested in calculating the rate of heat transfer per unit area, this Q double prime. Okay, um, Q double prime would be equal to some U times some delta T, some overall heat transfer coefficient times some delta T. This equation should look very familiar to us. And so what you do is to get U is you say calculate Q double prime divided by delta T. Okay, let's kind of go through some of the equations for that in this class for a single pane. So if I have a single pane window, just like I had, I have radiation and radiation, I have convection, I have convection, I have basically this glass right here. Um, because we're just doing calculation without the sun, we're looking at longer wavelength, uh, glass is essentially uh, black or a high emissivity that emittance is about 0.9 for the glass. Okay, so let's say it's, its emittance is 0.9, its absorpt, absorption is a 0.9 absorptance, and then also the reflectance is a 0.1 and it's opaque for that long wavelength radiation. Okay, how do I calculate the Q double prime? With a heat transfer. Well, I'd say, what is it by the radiation and what is it by the convection slash conduction? All right, so you, you have a temperature, 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 four temperatures. Okay. What is the uh, only mechanism to go between these two surface temperatures? Let me move this equation out of the way. Put it over here. What's what am I? What did I just introduce right there with dot dot with a little? What is that? Resistance. Thermal resistance to the glass. So what's our model for that thermal resistance? L over Ka, but I'm doing everything per unit area. So what do I mean by L? L is the thickness of the glass. This is a question. How thick is a window pane of glass? It's not three inches thick. I mean, we're not working at a bank, right? Bulletproof and all that. Um, you've probably thrown, who's, who's busted a window pane by throwing something as a kid or even as an adult? And so you go up and look, oops, I broke it. How thick was it? About eighth of an inch. So one eighth of an inch is kind of the thinnest, which is about uh, three millimeters. So, okay. Uh, yes, you can have thicker. You can have it um, up maybe more than eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch. But... Um, Let's think the standard thickness. Okay, then what's the thermal conductivity of glass? Well, it's about 1.4 or 1.1 or 1.2. Different sources have different temperatures. So we have the tools to get that resistance right there, L over K, thickness. But probably the hard part is getting what is the thickness and thermal conductivity of material. All right. Now, a little bit harder here, if you just do convection only, you just have a 1 over uh, H on the outside, area on the outside, that areas are going to cancel, aren't they? And then we have uh, 1 over H on the inside, area on the inside, okay? All right. Okay, I've got uh, 15 mile per hour wind air blowing on that window. What is my convection coefficient? This is like do I have a knife edge sharp plate with the beautiful growing of a boundary layer that is laminar? No. <laughs> um, so this is where sometimes the, the student feels cheated. It's like you were given all this beautiful theory and mathematics, but uh, the actual application makes it difficult. All right. Um, so let's skip that for a second. 
What about the thermal radiation? Well, we're going to have, um, this is pure convection, but you could also have another resistance like this to come out to the same temperature node. And this resistance is a 1 over H rad times A. What do you mean H rad? Chapter 1 is the most important <coughs> chapter of this textbook. In chapter one, they had an approximation for radiation transfer. They kind of linearized it. Does anybody remember what H rad was in the linearization? H rad, probably not, because it's been a while since you've been in chapter one. But it was the emissivity of the one surface. Here we're doing it for the, the glass pane. The sigma, what is that? Stefan Boltzmann constant. And then we had 4T average cubed. So that gives us there. At this point, we can actually make a calculation for some sort of radiative coefficient, which is linearizing the Stefan Boltzmann law. Let's make that calculation. What did we have? 0.9 for the emissivity. What was our Stefan Boltzmann constant? 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. What is a 4? That's easy, 4. Ah, my average temperature. Are we doing this for a winter window? Or are we doing it for a summer window? It's a little different. Uh, which one do you want to do, winter or summer? Winter? I heard two winters. Anybody else for summer? We're going for winter? Okay, what was our outdoor air temperature? Uh, did you pick 0F? Fine. Get that over to Kelvin because we're doing everything in SI. To get this average, we also have to get an estimate of this surface temperature of the glass right there, don't we? So it's like 0 on this. What's the glass temperature? Well, it's going to be closer to the outdoor temperature than the indoor temperature of what did we pick, 70 degrees F? But um, we have to pick something. Uh, you could pick it to be 30 degrees F. So let's pick this to be 30 degrees F. That gives us an average of 15 degrees F. Turn that into Kelvin. So t, t average. Let's pick it to 15 degrees F. Okay. So there. All right, so let me kind of pick it up here. What did we get for that average temperature? About 263 Kelvin. Put that cubed. And then this converts to what did we get? 3.7 watts per meter squared uh, Kelvin, if you like, because that looks easier. Okay, and now we have this HRAD, 1 over HRAD right here. And then if you actually went and did the convection, 1 over H, H convection, and then you combine them. How would I combine these two quote unquote resistors? Are they in parallel or series? Parallel. parallel. They're in parallel. And anyway, when you do that, some other people have worked on this and they've come up with an effective H. Uh, I'm not going to go through any more details of the math, but you have the tools of being what? So for the, um, the winter with the 15 mile per hour, with the emittance of 0.9 and some assumptions, they round off. It's about 6 BTU per hour foot squared degree F for 34 watts per meter squared degree C. All right. Part of it is radiation. The majority of it's convection. Majority of it's convection. All right. You then come over here and you have the same thing. You're going to have a resistance to the radiation in the interior of the room from the surface of the glass with the emittance of 0.9 or emissivity of 0.9. Likewise, some convection. Now the convection, um, still air with a little bit of natural convection is low in there. And so uh, you then combine these and when you combine them, you, you get that the H in the literature, they say it's about 1.46. BTU per hour foot squared degree F for about 8.3. Now, somebody says um, chapter one is the most important chapter in our textbook. What did they give for some convection coefficients for still air? 
And then for moving air, what did they give? What was the range? Remember that one table in chapter 1? Okay, look in chapter 1 and show me. Isn't for a gas natural convection, I don't know, from 5 to 25 watts per meter squared degree C? Is that, that's it, that's it. What's it, what's it say on the top line? Gases and free convection, what is it, 5 to 25? Uh, 2 to 25. 2 to 25, all right. And then what about forced convection? Yep, 25 to 250. Well, we don't have that high a force convection. It's a, it's a windy day outside. And so if we t to compare, uh, we're probably in the 5 to 10 range for natural convection. And we're in the 25, 30 range for the force convection. And when you come and take a look, whoops, right up here, the combination of the radiation and convection, even though the radiation in the room is a lot less, is uh, about is reported to be uh, eight and then thirty-four. So these are consistent. Okay, they're consistent. Okay. So if I have this value, what did we say this H naught was? Thirty-four. I even forgot already. Thirty-four watts per meter squared degree C. And this H on the inside is 8.3 watts per meter squared degree C. Um, we want to get this to be 1 over U, the U factor. The A is all cancel out of this equation. The only thing we didn't do is we didn't put in the L over K. The thickness 0 0.003 divided by the thermal conductivity about 1.1. So let me ask you to run this number. So we have 1 over U factor is equal to 1 over 34 plus 0 0.003 divided by 1.1 plus 1 over 8.3. That gives us really an R value in SI units. Then you reciprocate to get the U value, 6.58. Pretty good. Those are in what units? Watts per meter squared degrees let's go and do double pane two panes okay there's not any special coating on the glass we haven't even gotten to the low emissivity glass yet it's just regular glass but the emissivity of this glass is 0.9 the emissivity of the glass is 0.9 uh, we have to the thickness of the glasses are given uh, they're three millimeter and the conductivity is 1.1 watts per meter degree C. Likewise, same over here, thickness 3 millimeter K of 1.1 watt per meter degree C. Uh, we have to pick some backfill material. Air, you could, but the common to put argon in there. It's a little heavier molecule. It has properties which knock down the effective conductivity by at least about a half, not a half, about a 25%. So, Huh. We're going to have then our thermal network to have this resistance, then one resistance for natural convection inside of an enclosure, then the conduction resistance, and then the combination of radiation convection to the outside and inside. All right. So we're not going to change this one. That was 1 over 34 in the SI units. Did I do that right? Was it still 34? Yeah, and then 1 over 8.3 SI units. Uh, this actually is negligible and negligible. The conduction through the pane is negligible. But what about the convection? We have 1 over H of the gap times the A. We, we're taking off the A. Forget the A, right? You sum those up, you have 1 over UA. The A's cancel, cancel. Cancel, cancel. Okay, what tools do we have? How am I going to calculate H for argon? In a window that has a separation or gap thickness of about 25 millimeters. And when I look at the window like this, it may have a height of 1.2 meter, a width of 1 meter. And again, that thickness of enclosure is a point or 25 millimeter.
Do we have any tools? Do we cover anything in this textbook, in this class, to help us count, quantify that? It's an enclosure. It's natural convection in an enclosure. That's what it is because you can get one side has to be a little, let's say this is the uh, cold, wind, cold pane and this is the warmer hot pane. And so you get the possibility of buoyancy driven flow. That's why they don't make this 75 millimeters. Why? Well, because you get more convection inside the gap. Well, why don't they make it five millimeters? Well, because it's too small. Now, yes, you're holding it stationary, but if you separated it out a little bit, it would still be pretty stationary and you would have a better overall resistance to heat transfer. So you work through the math and do the engineers that did the design figured yeah, about, about an inch gap is good. It's thicker, but if you make it too wide, you get more natural convection and then it promotes heat transfer that way. Okay. So you're going to have to get a Rayleigh number, natural convection and enclosure. And then you get the Nusselt number. And often the Nusselt number is a constant Rayleigh to a power like a quarter. There's different correlations. Make sure you get the right one with the right aspect ratio. And then once you have the Nusselt number, you get the convection coefficient, which is the Nusselt K divided by whatever appropriate length scale you pick for that correlation for the Nusselt number and you get an H. Now, when I did this for these calculations in the interest of time, this H came in at 2 watts per meter squared degree C. So we have 1 over 34, 1 over 2, 1 over 8.3. Can you now give me the updated estimate of U, double pane, window, backfilled with argon, and no, no treatment of the, no low emissivity glass used. What do you get for you? I'm sorry? And that's watts per meter squared degree C. And now let's convert it over to the USCS system of units. 8.73 BTU per hour foot squared degree F. Do you guys agree? Okay, clicker question. I agree or disagree? A, agree. Or B, disagree. All right, so basically it boils down to this. Is, uh, is this equation right? 1 BTU per hour foot squared degree F equal to 5.678 watts per meter squared degree C, right? Or the reciprocal, I forget what it was that number, 5.678 reciprocal, is uh, uh, 1 watt per meter squared degree C equal to 0 0.176 uh, BTU per hour foot squared degree F. They're both equivalent, right? Okay. So anyway, let's grade it. It's a uh, disagree. It's wrong. What's wrong? This should be around 0 0.26. What, you mean this 1.5 is wrong? No. We are able to actually reproduce a U of 0.26. If you come back over here, you start to look. That's in the vicinity. In the vicinity. Well, now let's talk about treatments. So if you have clear gas, clear, not gas, glass, then as a function of wavelength, you can look at the transmission glass. Notice that we're starting at 0.3, goes to 0.4-ish, 0.3 to 0.4. What's in this range? the UV, but it drops off. Now, it does transmit some, but it's dropping off dramatically such that it's about zero transmission, anything below 0.3. Okay. Then in the visible region, if you had to take an average, what would you average the, the, the uh, transmittance of clear gas glass to be? 0. 0.87 something, 0.85, a little bit below 0.9. And then what is, what is happening out here? You're in this, this longer wavelength, 
It's what we call the solar IR or the uh, near field IR, infrared region. Uh, remember, the solar dumps a lot between 0.2 and 2 microns. There's a lot of energy, the solar sun, between 2 and 0.2 micron. And so in this vicinity, what would you call the average? About 0.8, right, in the solar IR. But they didn't plot this out, but if you go out to about 3 microns, it takes a nosedive and it's black. There's zero transmission through clear glass. Okay, then what you have for standard glass, here's a summary, is uh, when it gets beyond three microns, its transmittance is zero, its absorption uh, absorptivity is 0.84, about 0.85, and then about 15% or 16% is reflected. All right. But you can have different treatments on the glass surface such that it's a low E glass. Now, there's different low E glasses. If you had the so high solar gain low E glass, what are they trying to do? Yes, put a lot of light through, the visible light through, but then out in this region, they're trying to make it where you have high transmittance of the solar IR. But this is good for northern Minnesota. It's good for winter climate. What would be good for Texas in the summer climate, hot climate, would be that we're going to try to have low solar gain, bring this down as soon as you can and keep it down. All right. Um, these are from some website that I grabbed. So for low E glass, um, at long infrared wavelengths, it basically um, has a high reflectance on that surface and a low uh, absorption. So let's kind of do this. This is a summary. You have two double pane. They're clear. They're not treated. They're not low E glasses. And you're interested in a lot of transmission of visible light through the, the uh, window. It's, it looks like it's 79%. So if I take 79%, take the square root, each one is, uh, has a transmittance through this pane of about uh, 89%, almost 90%, 89%. So 0.89 times 0.89 gives me about 0.79. The solar heat gain coefficient is quite high. 70% um, of that solar energy is absorbed. Did I emphasize what is the fraction of the solar energy that is in the UV and in the visible and in, in the IR as a percent? I know that we have the Earth's surface, we have the atmosphere and the sunlight from the sun hitting the uppermost parts of our atmosphere has about 10% of its energy in the UV, has about, what is it, um, 52% uh, I believe in the IR and then what is that 38% in the visible light range um, you can double check us on that how do you how do you do this use that calculate that fraction between uh, zero wavelength and uh, 0.4 then the fraction that goes between uh, 0.4 the wavelength between 0.4 and 0.75 or 7, somewhere in there, and then the wavelength greater than uh, 0.7 out to infinity. All right. But what happens is the, the sunlight that actually gets to the surface is a different than what hits in the upper atmosphere, isn't it? And uh, there's something called O3 up there. What does O3 stand for? Ozone. And that's why we have banned refri certain refrigerants because they escape, they float up, and they interact with the ozone layer at high altitude, and then they eat a hole in it, and then we're a bit getting more UV light down at the Earth's surface than we like. Okay, so this actually reduces quite a bit. Maybe it's only 2%. Now, I don't know the fractions. They, they, they're reduced, okay, of the UV, and then you get more IR. Okay, so... 
what you want to do is you want to put some coating now on the surfaces such that you are going to let the visible light through this port with that spectrum and you don't want everything else through okay so here is one option here's another option let's focus on this option because I think it makes most sense to you and me we have a low solar gain that is a hot climate that's Texas and we have low E windows we have a double glazing so two two windows right here all right so what you want to do is you want to you can see what they're trying to do here is the the solar uh, heat gain coefficient you want to reduce that with still a appreciable visible light okay if you only had to treat two surfaces this surface number two or this surface number three what would you do with this surface right here you would treat it such that it had a um, um, high absorption let me go back to this plot such that it, it's not transmitting in this range but it's actually having a high absorptivity in that range isn't it so you have a high absorptivity in the solar IR region and then over here if you wanted to treat that surface you would put a high reflectivity in the solar region because isn't the the absorptivity plus the reflectivity for essentially an opaque surface equal to one or actually let me do this put this plus transmissivity equal to one you want this to be high okay leave that high but then the trade-off is is to make this a low emissivity low emittance that would have um, a high reflectance for this surface okay so if you wanted to you want to make this pane as hot as possible to help reject the heat out by absorbing the solar part of the spectrum there and then reflect it off back so what about this one this is a moderate solar gain maybe uh, or maybe we should contrast it with the high solar gain because it's really the, the uh, trade-off is to put the high solar gain for the winter climate low solar gain for the summer climates All right. So you can take a look at different websites. Uh, here is uh, some numbers. They have the argon backfilling, very common, 24 millimeter spacing in the, the, the two window panes. That's very, very common. They give a, uh, a value of the um, typical U value for thermally insulated windows. Here's the U of 1.1 watt per meter squared Kelvin, consistent with some of the numbers we ran. You can convert that over to USCS. Notice that they put different um, triple insulated glazing with a certain thickness total. And even they backfill, if you want to spend a lot of money, you can backfill with Krypton. I don't know how much more it costs than Argon, but Argon is going to be expensive. But what's true about Argon and Krypton, both of them are noble gases ideal gases which are noble they have high molecular weights uh, I think I already covered all this mm, there is more to say about the natural convection what is the difference between selecting argon and air if you go ahead and look at some convection correlation like this you notice a Nusselt number proportional to the Rayleigh number and then you undissect and say what is the the viscosity and the thermal diffusivity break them all down and you pick up a density to the three-fourths thermal conductivity to the three-fourths specific heat to the one-fourth so H is proportional to and that's really what your gas is doing it's providing a unique value of thermal conductivity density and specific heat and uh, so what happens is, is the um, because of the higher molar mass the density changes I didn't even flush this all out but you can see that just looking at those ratio properties there's a lower 25 percent lower 
value of ar from argon, switching from air to argon for the effective H in that gap. Well, I think I ran out of time. I hope I have given you a little appreciation for the complexity of windows, the importance of solar radiation in windows, as well as conduction and convection in windows, double pane windows. Thank you very much.